BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. I'd heard that the paintings were large, but that hadn't prepared me. Each was two and a half metres high and hung on the walls dwarfed me further so that I was the one under scrutiny. I stepped back and recognised some of the faces inspecting me. A celebrated author, a glowering actress, communist heroes. Others were unfamiliar. There was tragedy here and villainy too. But the painter, Xu Weixin, drew no distinctions. Xu Weixin was an unassuming man, bundled in a fat black vinyl jacket and marmalade-coloured sweater. There were over a hundred pictures in all, but one was missing, he told me. The very first portrait he had drawn as a child. He had grown up in China's far northwest. He had liked his gentle teacher, Miss Liu so was shocked and shamed when it all erupted. She was, they warned him, a class enemy, the daughter of a landlord. Outraged at the discovery, he steeled his heart and used his pen, pinned the hideous caricature to the blackboard, and still remembered as if it were this morning, the moment she walked in and saw it, and how the blood drained from her face. She understood already what might follow. You were eight, I began. I was only checking the details, but he took it for a different kind of question, about his culpability. Of course, I was responsible. It's only a question of how big or how small my responsibility was. Big enough that, all this time later, he devoted five years to these giants. Painting them helped him take responsibility, he said. They were tied to that first picture, for which he still felt guilty, but which had helped him to understand how people could turn upon each other. He hoped that one day they could hang in a museum, confronting browsers who might, perhaps, be forced into reflection. But the difficulties of his project were encompassed by its title, the careful Chinese Historical Figures, with its telltale addendum. 1966-76. to 76. Those were the dates of the Cultural Revolution, the decade of Maoist fanaticism which saw as many as two million killed for their supposed political sins and another 36 million hounded. They were guilty of thought crimes, criticism of Chairman Mao or the party or its policies. Others, like Xu's teacher, were guilty by blood their parentage enough to condemn them. The hysteria, violence and misery had forged modern China. But the movement was rarely mentioned these days. Fear, guilt and official suppression had relegated it to the fringes of family histories and the dustiest of shelves. The ten years of the Cultural Revolution were savage, unrelenting and extraordinarily destructive. The violence and hatred terrorised the nation, annihilated much of its culture and killed key leaders and thinkers. It was also an ideological crusade. People were to be remade or removed. And what made China's slaughter unique was that people killed their own kind and that the line between victims and perpetrators shifted moment by moment. I knew the facts, but hadn't truly grasped how recent this all was, nor how close. I had arrived in 2008, the year that Beijing was to host the Olympics, as a correspondent for The Guardian. I began to sense the Cultural Revolution in almost every subject I covered, and to realise that it was a silence, a space that made sense of everything existing above or around it. Victims and perpetrators struggle to live with what happened and what they did. A decade has simply disappeared. I knew her at once. At almost 60, Yu Shangzhen had the same bob, youthful face and slight figure as the 13-year-old schoolgirl whose portrait by Xu Wei Xin had intrigued me. 
The painter had stumbled across her online as he looked for subjects for his series, ordinary citizens to accompany the images of actors and politicians. Since retiring from a job in state media, Yu had begun to write blogs chronicling her memories of life as a young Red Guard. Her essays had intrigued the painter, but her mother and son fretted for her, and her brother, a retired official, would call her to warn that she was looking for trouble. There were certain things you could not say, even half a century later. We carried our mugs to a quiet corner table, and she began her story. Her family had lived on the fringes of the Red Elite. At primary school, she had sat beside the children of Politburo members. By the spring of 1966, Mao had begun another round of his periodic purges. He'd summoned the senior leadership to warn of enemies hidden in the party, who were waving red flags while secretly plotting the bourgeoisie's supremacy. Rooting them out would be a life-and-death struggle, he warned. Ignite the Cultural Revolution! The words appeared on a big character poster attacking Peking University's leadership. Within hours, on Mao's instruction, it was read over the radio, and in the heat of his encouragement, it all burst into life, scrawled white sheets blossoming across the walls of schools and colleges, and you and her friends were to be Mao's shock troops. Late on a stultifying summer night, their call came. At 3am on 18th August, summoned at only a few hours' notice, the twenty-strong band gathered outside their school. They marched in line through the night all the way from the campus to Tiananmen Square. As dawn broke, a million students flooded the great expanse. Red guards took place of honour on the stands, waiting for leaders to address them. And then, there was Chairman Mao himself, walking slowly back and forth before them, holding his hand up to acknowledge their cheers. You watched as a girl, just a few years older, climb the podium to present a Red Guard armband. The moment would forever symbolise the birth of the Cultural Revolution. This was history. Mao called young people the morning sun, and they glowed in this dawn, so proud and, frankly, happy the little red books of his quotations thrust into the air. Their voices were hoarse with crying out, Long live Chairman Mao! After that, it was as if whatever we did was at Mao's order. Being a red guard felt like being on top of the world, you said, almost glowing as she recalled it. All we heard, thought, and studied at school was to be good children of Chairman Mao's, as if he were a god, and our sole mission was to be a part of the revolution. Lin Biao, defence minister and toady in chief, urged them all to smash the four olds, the ideas, culture, customs and habits of the exploiting classes. After that day, everyone you knew declared themselves a red guard for this was no longer the work of the elite, but the mission of the masses. Packs of adolescents encircled their prey, slashed tight trousers, sliced the tips off pointed shoes. The city was looking different already, the clothes greyer, the adults quicker to lower their gaze or smile approval as the children passed. People could be persecuted for no reason at all, you said. The Red Guards could just go into their houses, beat them, and take away their belongings. One night their leader summoned them. A capitalist had attacked Red Guards who were searching his house. You, though frightened, knew her duty. But when we saw people beating that family, my friend and I were so scared. Two girls came in, slightly older than us, both wearing their Red Guard uniforms. They asked us to take part. They gave us a belt with a metal buckle. I didn't think these people deserved to be beaten up. I grew up with a grandmother who was very kind, and she taught me it was wrong to scold people, let alone beat them. I was too scared, and we ran back to school. 
another breath. I lacked the basic ability to tell right from wrong. I still thought it was right, because everything I heard was that we needed to break the old world, to build a new one. The horror of Red August set my hair on end. It was the utmost cruelty. The screams of prisoners, tortured on the school campus, penetrated the dormitories and pierced Yu's dreams. So I complained I couldn't sleep to the Red Guard's deputy commander, and he asked me if I wanted to go on a tour to mobilize people to participate in the Cultural Revolution. That's how, on 31st August, I went to Shanghai and saw something I will never be able to forget, she continued. We were looking for a car to carry us to Beijing Station. It was dark, and I heard someone whispering, and saw a man crawling towards me from the basketball court. Then I saw the court. It was almost covered in dead bodies. All had been beaten to death. She wasn't remembering. She was there in 1966 again. Despite it all, the autumn was golden. It was freedom from lessons and rules and routines. They said you had to see the country to embrace the work of the revolution, explained Yu. Red guards travelled free on the trains. They were heading nowhere and everywhere. Hundreds of miles and hundreds more. They passed fields and oxen, ramshackle towns. One of the boys taught them all to swear. Cursing was red, the language of the streets. Yu practised diligently. This was revolution. This was Chairman Mao's work. This was exhilaration. It didn't matter that she was 13. It didn't matter that she was a girl. It was a season of exploration, pitted here and there by denunciation rallies and other cruelties which she couldn't quite reconcile, sustained by the great adventure of their mission. But after so many years, what had summoned her back to those days? prompted her to keep writing and asking questions. There's no one who thinks like me in real life, you said. Elsewhere, online, it was another story, though. The whispers began to multiply. Some, like you, found a new space to share their stories. Some were emboldened to speak for the first time. I don't think they feel guilty. I've asked some of them, she continued. I think they felt lucky because they were beating people instead of being beaten. There was no sense of guilt at all. In the whole country, there's no atmosphere of reflection. She looked suddenly tired. I turn 60 very soon, she told me. There isn't much time left. BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. Octogenarian composer Wang Xilin was tall, broad-shouldered and still lean. Slate-grey hair fell in a debonair sweep above his face, which broke into a smile when he saw me. He was waiting beneath the red eaves of the concert hall in the Beijing Central Conservatory of Music, shaking the hands of friends and urging them in. Wang's quartet slashed through the gentle spring evening. It was stark and angular, with sweeps of forceful cello building into a dark, almost cinematic pursuit. The programme notes said little of the music, focusing instead on the composer's biography, tracing his career up to his studies at the Shanghai Conservatory in 1962. The next sentence with almost comic evasion, began. After the Cultural Revolution, Wang returned to Beijing in early 1978. The blank felt apt. The Cultural Revolution's devastation was wreaked above all within the cultural realm. 
In 1966, Mao's May 16 notification attacked senior leaders for giving freaks and monsters free reign in the arts. In the years that followed, the country's greatest writers, artists and musicians would be humiliated or destroyed. At the start of 1966, there were 35 professional theatres in Shanghai. By December, there was one. Private collections of paintings were burned or smashed by Red Guards. Foreign and reactionary books were burned or pulped. If a novel was French or textbook American, if a person was the son of a landlord or the wife of a Kuomintang official, they were on the wrong side of history. Wang Xilin was one of them. When I visited Wang Xilin's home a few days after the concert, he quickly poured tea and drew his chair up closer to talk. He was cheerful, vigorous, and disconcertingly quick to laugh at the craziness of even the most traumatic parts of history. Wang grew up thousands of miles from Beijing, in northwestern Gansu province. His father had been a Kuomintang official. In 1948, when Wang was ten, his father died and the family slid into destitution. One year later, as the Communist Party celebrated its liberation of China, one of its military culture and arts troops passed through his town. Their exuberant playing lured him from his schoolhouse. By the time his mother found out what had happened, he was in Langzhou, hundreds of miles away, entertaining the troops. In 1955, aged 18, his talents won him transfer to a musical military college in Beijing. Two years later, he won a place to study composition at the Shanghai Conservatory. Once there, he threw himself instead into the ceaseless political campaigns. Soon he was head of the Communist Youth League. And yet, as his classmates outstripped him, mastering new instruments, winning awards, bourgeois personal ambition stirred again. And by graduation, he had completed his first symphony, it would not be played for 37 years. When I asked what precisely had damned the symphony, his face darkened. They were confiscating everything, and it was still quite a tragic style. All the Communist Party wanted was happy music to praise them. On graduation, Wang joined the Central Broadcasting Station's orchestra, but it was not the haven he'd anticipated. The instructions on democratising culture struck him as ridiculous. How could a symphony orchestra, which had to perfect its mastery, be close to the masses? Bursting with scorn, he spoke for two hours at the next day's meeting. His political record and military background spoke for themselves. He wasn't afraid. Over a hundred staff were sitting in the room. No one else spoke. Mao's resolve to cleanse Chinese culture intensified once he ruled the country. Leading thinkers and artists were hounded, disgraced and driven from jobs and homes. The celebrated poet, Ai Qing, was dispatched to a labour camp in the deserts of northwestern Xinjiang. His family was exiled with him, and his son, the artist, Ai Weiwei, recalled a childhood living in a room dug into the ground. Wang could hardly have missed all this. His own sister, a low-level carder in Gansu, was purged and denounced so brutally she went mad. It never occurred to me that my sister's problems had anything to do with me. So I was audacious and criticised the officials, Wang recalled. I didn't think about the results until one week later, when people said my speech was anti-party. Then I was scared, because that was a big crime. Wang had revealed his true impulses, and now he had to be remade. First came the kindly warnings. Shouldn't he think again? What of the army and party's benevolence? Wang wept with shame as he penned a long essay on his mistakes. It took two full hours to read aloud but the moment he concluded his list of failings, 
His colleagues rose and a cry rang out. Wang's self-criticism is a battle cry against the Communist Party. It was a disaster, said Wang. It was the first of ten such sessions. Each time he faced a hundred people. A senior official oversaw the last meeting, the crowd hushing to catch his low voice. He had checked Wang's background, the Kuomintang father and counter-revolutionary sister. Wang was a saboteur. He was dismissed from the Youth League and ordered to Shanxi. Da Tong had a rich Buddhist heritage, but by 1964, when Wang arrived, it had grown into another grimy mining city. The once ebullient young man did what he could to scrape his way to forgiveness. He slaved at the toughest physical labour, volunteering to empty latrines, he composed a choral work praising local carders. The leaders were unmoved. By early 1966, he was in a mental hospital. Six months later, they discharged him, and he was taken straight to prison, and the following day to the first struggle session. The struggle sessions were themselves performances, elaborately staged with costumes of high dunces' caps and choruses of denunciation choreographed parades of humiliation and bodies contorted into abstract positions. The dramatic rituals built to a climax of beating. Before me, Wang hunched over to show how he was forced to stand in the aeroplane position on a long, high, narrow bench alongside other victims as a crowd threw projectiles and hit them. In 1968, the campaign stepped up. He was moved, with seven other captives, to a hut. The Black Ghost's Room, people called it. As soon as the struggle meetings ended, Wang would be put back to work again, straining to haul his battered body, laden with buckets of water, up city hillsides. One freezing night he was pulled from the shed, blindfolded, gagged, bound and dragged to a field where his tormentors forced him to stumble in dizzying circles. They threw him into a deep pit and buried him up to his neck. Then they pulled him out again to beat him until the blood ran. He plotted escape, but halted each time. He learned of those who had swum from Guangzhou to Hong Kong, risking sharks and drowning, and envied them. But he was in Shanxi, deep in the interior, and there was nowhere to run. But he knew that one day he would write the symphony of his story. He was standing on a truck one day, about to be dispatched to the countryside for more struggle sessions, when they came looking for him. An ambitious official from another county wanted to stage a model opera. He had scoured the area for anyone with experience and was taking Wang to assist him. He had been fortunate. Wang's new home was Changzhe, in the south of the province, a hard scrabble place where the barely educated peasants knew nothing of arts and culture. He scoured the region to assemble a band of musicians and performers. It was new for them to see Western instruments like violins and an orchestra. Without forced political power, these kinds of places would never have seen this, said Wang. It was a kind of progress. Wang fused the lyrics of the model opera, sent down from the centre, with Shangzi opera tunes more apt for the area and hints of the classical techniques he had learned. The production began to garner attention, touring even outside the province. Nightmares still plagued Wang, but he was less fearful now. He was not writing the music he wanted, but he was creating again. In his flat, Wang's piano bore framed photographs of his family, but the most striking was a picture of himself in the year he returned from exile. Somehow he looked older than he did today, and wilder, a Heathcliff with dark, disturbing eyes. Since his return to Beijing, he had found work at the conservatory, got married and divorced, raised a daughter, 
but mostly he had studied and worked. In the aftermath of the Cultural Revolution, everyone wanted to experience everything. The cultural deep freeze of the Maoist era began to thaw. Banned books reappeared. Wang thrilled and shivered to blasts of Western music. They really were afraid of Stravinsky. Avant-garde art burst forth. And in the newly discovered discordance of Schoenberg and others, Wang found a language to express the torment of everything he had learned in Shanxi. Darkness, hypocrisy, and evil. Around him, the political arguments were growing louder, more confident. Wang threw off his hard-learned caution and penned two essays, criticising Maoism. By 1999... Wang was enjoying official favour again. Beijing's government commissioned two composers to write new works to mark the millennium. Wang was one of them. On an early morning in November 1999, he stood in the rehearsal room, the Beijing Symphony Orchestra ready in front of him. The conductor had asked him to say a few words about Symphony No. 4 at the rehearsal. Wang said... The 20th century was the century of communism. Many people pursued it and then abandoned it. They cancelled the concert. They simply froze me out. I couldn't work at the conservatory or publish anything. I was furious. The methods were different, the punishment milder. But to Wang, the impetus was identical instantly recognisable from the Cultural Revolution. The performance I had seen was the first of his works that the Central Conservatory had hosted, more than 13 years since Wang's Fall from Grace. While his music had been performed around the world, it was barely heard in China. BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. Wang Jingyao saved everything. His wife's bloody clothes were folded in a suitcase, hidden beneath the bed. He hoped that one day she would be vindicated, that these things might be displayed, that the public would see the evidence. When everyone else was busy forgetting, Wang had persisted in remembering, secretly, carefully, stubbornly. Teacher Bian was Beijing's first victim, battered to death by her pupils in the early days of Red August. Her husband, Wang, was a historian, and though he could not protest her death, he documented it. Here's a family portrait. The four children are smart enough for a studio. They're lined up by size, von Trapp style, behind the battered body of the woman who once fed and soothed them. Here are Bien's daughters again, with a basin, washing her corpse, its swollen face, its bruises. Here are the posters hounding Bien, pinned up around their rooms. The Red Guard's broken days before they killed her. They hung the place with hatred. Wang's rage was hard, like a diamond. He captured everything. He photographed the smoke from the crematorium chimney. He rigged up a secret shrine for her ashes. His wife had seen it all coming. The violence did not explode. It built. It had begun with that first big character poster and its broadcast on Mao's orders. The next day, pupils at the girls' school attached to Beijing Normal University scrawled their own attack on the management. Bian was vice-principal. Though a party veteran, her position, reputation and background as the daughter of a banker marked her as a target. Foreigners sometimes summon Lord of the Flies when they talk about that summer. This carnival of violence and hate the young girls remorselessly stalking their piggy. But it was worse than the fiction. No plane crash, 
No desert island was required. This happened in the midst of civilization, a civilization founded in large part on respect for scholars, elders, and authority. The teenagers who killed Bian Zhongyun were not feral, as much as well drilled. Officials ignored Bian's plea for help, and Wang began to understand that there was no escape, nowhere to go, no one else to beg. Beating someone like me to death is just like killing a dog, Bian told her husband. One morning she woke earlier than usual. She shook hands with Wang, as though they were strangers. Then she went to work. The girls at the school poured ink over victims. They forced them to kneel in the blistering sun and to carry large baskets laden with earth. When Bien fell, they trampled her in their heavy army boots. Someone yelled for clubs. They dragged her to clean the toilets. You fake death! A girl screamed. Her companions tried to make Bien drink from the filthy mop. They were laughing. They ordered the man from the toilets to load her onto a rubbish cart outside. She lay, covered in blood and dirt. The heat was unbearable. The teenagers drifted away. The hospital was metres away, but it was hours before students and a teacher took Bien across the street. Treatment, when it began, was too late. At school the next day, a 14-year-old pupil, Wang Youqin, listened as a student leader claimed the loudspeaker and announced Bien's death. She died! It is over! There was a short silence in the classroom, and someone changed the subject. As if Bien had been a dream, and her being beaten to death was no big deal. Yo Chin waited for someone to speak. For days, then months, then years. She wrote diaries, then burned them, frightened they might be found. When the Cultural Revolution was over, she wrote it all down again. She had seen the gang forcing teachers to their knees. She had heard one yell to another to fetch clubs. I thought my job was to tell my story. I thought other people would write the rest. But even 20 years later, they still hadn't done it. When the Cultural Revolution ended, the early Red Guards never faced trial for cases such as Teacher Bian's death. With the help of her husband and other witnesses, Yo Chin began to piece together events. She moved to the United States to study and amassed more names, more murders, more suicides. In 2000, she started a website, Chinese Memorial, naming the dead. Authorities blocked her site, yet the names kept coming from those still mourning and those seeking only to bear witness. Yo Chin hunted down newspapers and documents. Harder was persuading people to talk. I didn't realise people would hate it so much. All these years later. All I need to do is follow the truth. It was just obvious to me. Bian Zhongyun was killed. You have to admit that. But with time, other pupils from her school began to talk about Bian too. They collected money for a statue of the teacher. Then they rowed about what to put on the plaque. Some wanted to say that she had died through the violence of the Cultural Revolution. Others insisted that there was nothing to write. In the end, as a compromise, they put her birth and death dates. 1916 to 5 August 1966. Her husband was really mad, Yu Chin added. At least they put the date of her death. The Cultural Revolution covers a few scant paragraphs in Chinese textbooks. There is no mention of suffering and death, certainly no mention of the victims. There isn't any mention of teacher Bian. To anyone who lived through the era, however, her pupil Song Bin Bin is famous or notorious, 
It was Sung who wrote that first big character poster attacking the teachers. She was at school on the day that Bien died. Less than two weeks later, when Mao gathered a million delirious red guards in mid-August, it was Sung who climbed the dais to present him with her armband. He asked her name, Bin Bin, as in refined. Then he told her, Ya Wu Ma, be marshal. Propaganda footage shows that encounter, that defining image of the era. Carefully, she pins the red band onto the chairman's arm. Seen too close up, Mao is not a radiant icon, but a plump, ageing man. Despite his height approaching six feet, he sags in his baggy suit. Sung's in army uniform too. She wears her hair in two little knots, like bunches. Even with her eyes blurry behind spectacles, you can see how thrilled she is, all teeth as she pumps his hand. A photograph of their meeting appeared on the front of newspapers across the country. I put a red armband on Chairman Mao. Beneath that boast came a vow to carry on the great proletarian cultural revolution to the end, and the words, violence is truth. Institutions across the country renamed themselves B. Marshall School, and the students followed Mao's instructions as they had once obeyed their teachers. This is something that never happened in 3,000 years of Beijing's history, said Yu Qin. Of course, people were killed here, but by soldiers or armies or criminals. Never teenagers and students. The violence rippled across the land. Mao wearing the armband meant that he too was a member of the Red Guards, said Wu De, a historian of the era. The newspapers called him the Red Commander of the Red Guards, and that meant that everything the Red Guards did was supported by the party. From that piece of cloth you could draw a line to the destruction of the four olds and the killings which swept the capital. And so, as Yu Chin said, one school story reflected all that was wrong about the Cultural Revolution. One name became synonymous with red guards and violence. Song Bin Bin. There was no evidence that she beat her teacher. She and her friend described telling pupils attacking staff that day to stop. But many wrongly believed or assumed that she had killed Bien and others. Her moment of triumph in Tiananmen Square looked like a reward for violence, as well as a spur to it. For decades, Sung said little. And then the news began to bubble across the internet. People had advised her not to discuss the past. Few Red Guards did. But as the years passed, a number came forward to confess to persecuting teachers. Their apologies drew some sympathy, and in Beijing, the close attention of the historian Wu De. He had devoted several issues of his digital magazine, Remembrance, to teacher Bian's death, and had encouraged Sung Bin Bin to apologise. In 2012, Wu persuaded her to write about what had happened on the day of Bien's death. Now he pressed her to say sorry. It was January 2014. Sung was in her sixties. Tears gleamed behind her glasses as she read her statement. I failed to protect the school's leaders, she said. How a nation faced its future was largely determined by how it faced its past. She hoped that all those who did wrong in the Cultural Revolution would face up to themselves, reflect on the Cultural Revolution, seek forgiveness and achieve reconciliation. That reflection must start from myself. Sung's apology was too late, too little. Too contrived, too superficial, raged her critics. It was an attempt to exculpate the children of the elite. A cartoon circulated online of a weeping crocodile in a red guard uniform. 
Far from achieving reconciliation, Sung's apology had unsettled those who suffered the greatest loss and sparked vicious rows over memory, guilt and repentance. A furious statement in Wang Jingyao's name surfaced on Chinese websites. His anger spurred him to pick up the phone to me. I don't believe their apology, because I don't dare to believe them. Red guards cannot be trusted, he spat. Wang believed the worst, and why wouldn't he? His wife's murder was dismissed as an accident. He was forced to hide the facts and conceal her ashes and remember her in secret, like a man ashamed. Wang, who had spent half a lifetime remembering, was too old and too tired, while others who had tried to forget now wanted to remember. BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. No one had thought a revolution could be boring. But by late 1968, the Red Guard's excesses had come to an end. After two years of study sessions and struggle sessions and nothing much to do, even the keenest felt their fervour ebbing. Mao had planned a three-year movement, but after two and a bit, even he was irked by the chaos. He had ordered the military to curb the Red Guards. And so, on another long, dull day, Yu Shangzhen was summoned by a leader and handed a batch of papers. Her job was to deliver them to friends and schoolmates. It happened overnight, she said. There were four possibilities for young people. You could join the army, which was considered glorious. You could work in a factory, as I did. That was thought very lucky, because you got to stay in the city close to your parents. You could go with the construction corps, the state farming schemes. The worst option was that you would go to the villages. But that was where almost all of them ended up. Yu's classmates were the first wave in the great tide of urban adolescence that swept towards impoverished rural China. Seventeen million boys and girls, enough to people a nation of their own. They are known now as the Lost Generation. But the party called it going up to the mountains and down to the countryside, capturing its lofty justifications and the humble soil in which these students were planted. Some were as young as 14. Many had never spent a night away from home. They were sent hundreds or thousands of miles away, and back a century, to places with no electricity or running water, perhaps not even reachable by road. As you walked from door to door handing out notices, every family wept. Since most had relatives in the countryside, they knew how harsh life there could be. Many had lost family members in the Great Famine. Now the urban youth would drag forward villages mired in poverty and ignorance. The propaganda posters show them marching to the fields for another day of labour. They have often paused to address a cheery, wrinkled peasant. Are pink-cheeked always, guileless, hearty. These handsome children in cotton jackets have sickles or hoes slung over their shoulders, and in their free hands they hold, of course, quotations from Chairman Mao Zedong. Now, here they were before me upon the stage. They were uniformed, Mao capped and arm banded, clutching little red books to their hearts as they sang. The slightest of the trio called himself Zhong Sheng, or voice of China, being an educated youth, a city kid sent down to the country had made him braver and stronger, he said, when he stepped off the platform. He was grateful to China's leaders. The cluster around him nodded and smiled. They were the Chongqing Educated Youth Friendship Group, and I had met them quite by chance in a park the previous day. But they were not youths anymore. 
but in late middle age. They met up two or three times a week to climb mountains, eat hot pot, play mahjong and sing. Once a year, after months of preparation, they staged their extravaganza. I surrendered to the waves of activity. Group photos, songs, dances, photos, mouth-numbing chicken, more songs. A hand eased into mine. I looked down into Auntie Goo's sweet smile and crinkling eyes. We're proud of being educated youth. It was something unprecedented, she told me. And educated youth was, is, the only part of the cultural revolution that can be discussed and celebrated. The next time I saw Auntie Gu, we made our way to Chongqing University for a picnic. Carts of pineapple along the street sweetened the warm spring air. Women scooped cherries and inky mulberries from woven panniers. Families picnicked on the campus amid willows and great thickets of bamboo. We straggled down the long slope, eventually converging on a little pavilion set upon the lake. Sometimes I envy them a bit, said Auntie Huang. We were watching a couple of teenage girls in jeans and pastel T-shirts. We only had blue or grey clothes. Just like today's young people, I wanted to do many things, like go to university, but I couldn't realise them. We had no hope at all. We thought we'd spend our whole lives there. I missed my mum and dad. There was a lot of bitterness. One of the men began to sing, and Auntie Gu joined them. They all knew this one from those long, dark evenings, its evocation of a kerosene lamp in the dimness of a little cottage and of bitter tears dampening their clothes. At the very beginning, we were all idealistic. We wanted to make a difference to the countryside, Auntie Huang recalled. But the villages were filthy and desolate, and the bone-thin peasants were unimpressed by their theories for grand improvements. Auntie Gu really wanted to learn from the farmers, but the work left her bruised and blistered. Drought brought a swift end to their extra rations and left them surviving on corn husks, as the peasants did. The boy who wrote the Educated Youth Song received a suspended death sentence for its dangerously reactionary sentiments. Its lyrics evoked his longing for his mother, his hometown, and his school days. It took luck, ingenuity, and drive to escape the countryside. Young people stole back illegally only to find themselves trapped in petty crime, or even injured themselves to win medical approval to go home. Girls were pressured to pay for their route home with sex. Rural desperation gradually coalesced into mass resistance, and by 1978, open protest. Educated youth began striking, demonstrating, demanding a return. Auntie Gu finally made it home in 1979. It didn't strike the group as curious that they spent so much time dwelling on the place they had fought so hard and so long to escape. Their rural misery defined them. It stood for sacrifice, community, selflessness and grit. They had earned their homes, their restaurant dinners, their lipsticks. While other parts of the Cultural Revolution were stamped down out of sight, deep into the mud of the past... This was elevated as part of the national story. It's only because the decades have passed that we think about the good things when we recall it. At the time, it was all very painful, acknowledged Auntie Huang. Life was so miserable. It had meaning to them. It wasn't, as some thought, just a waste of their best years, time stolen from them. Yes, I wonder that. She seized the question. It was time wasted. She thought for a moment more and brightened. The best part was that we went through so many hardships when we were young, that hardships we met later seemed like nothing. Her smile undid me.
The galley was bright, light, but claustrophobic. I had visited the Jian Chen Museum Cluster in Sichuan. All around were mirrors and mirrors, reflections of reflections. There were thousands of them. There were mirrors with Mao's face and many more with Mao's instructions and poems. They showed bridges and plum blossom, the great hall of the people, red flags and heroes from the model operas. Endless sunflowers turning towards their sun. Another Mao. Mao before a red sun. Several mirrors bore the words of Lin Biao, then, not for long, the coming man. The defence minister had helped to launch Mao's personality cult. All his words are incitements to devotion to his boss. Read Chairman Mao's books, listen to Chairman Mao's words, and follow Chairman Mao's instructions. I tried to imagine combing my hair beneath these exhortations. The mirrors existed not to reflect you as you were, but to show you the person you should be. Devoted, persistent, healthy, patriotic, ideologically correct. Disorientated, I tried the Red Age Living Necessities exhibition hall. There were pillowcases and harmonicas and bellows, all marked with Mao's words. Mao quotes everywhere, on maths books with his image at the centre of the sun, the beams radiating from him. Tea caddies, biscuit tins, stacked copies of the Little Red Book. They had pulped copies in the post-Mao years, but there were plenty spare. A billion were printed during the Cultural Revolution. It remains the second most published book in the world, after the Bible. It was the sheer volume of domestic memorabilia, the basins, towels, matches, cups, that really indicated his godlike status. Not only omnipotent, but omnipresent. He or his words were on your pillow as you slept and kept you warm through the night. He was there when you woke, as you washed and dried your face, as you took a gulp of tea. He watched over everything you did. On a wall, a red and white rubber ring quoted Mao's encouragement to swim. His love of the water was genuine. His personal photographer told me once how she would snap him floating on his back, puffing on a cigarette. That was before she too was purged in the Cultural Revolution. But his swimming was also political, because everything was political. He used it to humiliating effect against Khrushchev, forcing the non-swimming Soviet leader to don a pair of armbands at a friendly summit in his private pool. After months out of the public eye in 1966, Mao resurfaced in July to swim in the Yangtze at Wuhan. The front page of the People's Daily noted that he had covered 15 kilometres in just 65 minutes, a speed to astonish today's Olympians. I moved on. Scores of identical white busts were stacked upon each other, filling four cases. I was told of a factory worker who married at the height of the movement. Instead of the household essentials she needed, she received only statues of Mao. They were everywhere in her tiny home, on the table, on the bed, since it was unthinkable to give them away. You wore Mao everywhere you went. A gold face in a red enamel circle as shiny and inviting as a foiled toffee penny. Billions of the badges were made, enough for every man, woman and child to demonstrate their loyalty four times over, and enough to exhaust China's aluminium. One collector estimated that 40,000 aircraft could have been built, and Mao himself reportedly demanded... Give back our planes. BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. The day began at 6.15am in Nanjiatsun as the East is Red blasted through the speakers and echoed down the wide, empty streets, 
past the blazingly white statue of Mao, with his arm raised in perpetual salute. I was here in 2015 to write a piece on his legacy, to mark the 120th anniversary of his birth. This village in Henan, central China, was one of the country's few remaining communes. Across the country, from cottages to penthouses, families enjoyed the fruits of capitalism, potato crisps and fake Nike t-shirts, or sports cars and Chateau Lafitte. But Nan Jietsun prided itself on standing above such indulgences. Workers sang revolutionary songs before their shifts ended instead of fidgeting on smartphones. They received grain rations for their labour and spent food tokens in public stores on their way home to free government flats, identical down to their gilt electronic Mao clocks. Except when the loudspeakers burst into life, the whole place was eerily quiet. It felt like stepping back in time. But the story of Nan Jietsun wasn't quite so simple. The Mao statue went up in the 90s. The 30-foot pictures of Marx, Engels, Lenin and Stalin arrived the following decade, apparently to entice more visitors rather than inspire residents. Communism seemed to be as much a promotional gambit as a political commitment. At dusk, the tannoys blared with another party classic, assuring all listeners that a communist society would surely be achieved. I strolled back through the streets, even quieter now, to eat overcooked dumplings and sip warm beer at the hotel restaurant, when the phone rang. Remember me? It seemed rude to admit the truth. In any case, he continued at once. It's Gao Guang. Lin Biao? Lin Biao? Now I remembered him. We'd met a year or so earlier when I was writing a piece on Mao impersonators, who seemed almost as prevalent in China as Alvises were in the West. There were dozens of varying girths and statures, and even a female Mao, surprisingly convincing, who complained that her husband had gone off sex and she took on the role. They acted in TV plays and graced official functions. One day they might open a restaurant, the next attend a jail to raise staff morale and re-educate the prisoners. The one I arranged to interview had turned up in full costume, latex mole and all. To my astonishment, he was accompanied by the notorious traitor of the era, Lin Biao. He had refused to speak until Mao had given permission. Then I learned that his name was Gao Shi Guang, and that he had begun impersonating just a few years before. I'd kept in touch, hoping to see a performance, but he was so cagey that I'd given up. I wondered what, after all this time, had prompted him to call. He named a date almost a month away. Was I free? All the others would be there. Mao and Zhou Enlai and maybe Chiang Kai-shek. Sure, I said, I'd be happy to come. What was the performance? Great! It's my grandson's hundredth day party. I would be playing a role too, I realised. Gao's foreign friend. Everyone was hustling. I had my own transaction in mind. If Gao trusted me, he might take me to one of his appearances. I was still fascinated by the sheer implausibility of impersonating Lin Biao, the country's chief sycophant turned scapegoat. Gao Guang had been a small boy when Lin was at the height of his power, a military hero and Mao's chosen successor. To understand the man he was impersonating, he scowled biographies and pored over footage to perfect the gestures and voice that would bring Lin to life. The resemblance was striking. Few youngsters recognised him, he conceded, but the over-fifties knew at once. When they and Gao were boys, Lin Biao was one of China's ten great marshals. Lin was Mao's best student, once enjoining his comrades to carry out Mao's instructions, whether you understand them or not. He did more than almost anyone, bar Mao himself, to establish the Mao cult. 
but by September 1971. It was obvious that Mao had turned against the man he had so recently depended on. Lin's family panicked. He fled the country late at night with his wife and son on a plane that crashed in Mongolia, killing all on board. The public waited almost a year to be told what had happened. The announcement was astounding. Lin, at the very heart of the party, had been a rightist traitor. He had plotted to assassinate Mao and seize power, and bolted when his plans were discovered. But the official verdict raised more questions than it answered. Lin Biao, celebrated for his devotion to the Cultural Revolution and to Mao, had hated and conspired against everything he praised? Worse still, it seemed their omniscient leader was shockingly fallible, having nurtured a traitor. Those who had kept their idealism throughout the turmoil began to ask questions. And Mao's death did nothing to salvage Lin's reputation. Conveniently dead, he could be blamed for fanning the Cultural Revolution's flames. He was a perpetual villain, condemned to be forever on the wrong side of party history. But in 2007, more than 35 years after his death, Lin's portrait was added to the Chinese Military Museum. I wouldn't have dared to imagine being Lin Biao before that, Gao admitted. But it didn't explain why Gao wanted to impersonate Lin, even if he thought it was safe. Playing the father of the nation was one thing, but acting its arch-traitor? No one shows any negative attitude towards me, Gao snapped. People admire his military talents, so they are very interested in him. After a performance, people will shake hands with me, hug me, and have their pictures taken. It was social responsibility, Gao said, promoting red culture to the next generation. His day job was as a cameraman and director for army propaganda videos, and I wondered if playing Lin had helped him forge useful contacts. There was nothing intentionally kitsch about the impersonators. They were earnest in their work. Yet what was not permissible as history in China was allowed as entertainment. The country had several cultural revolution restaurants serving up tragedy as farce. At Beijing's Red Classics restaurant, gaudily scarlet, you could have a fully themed wedding, posing for photos in matching Mao suits on the tractor parked in one corner. Customers ordered party secretary aubergine and educated youth's fatty meat from a menu printed to look like a party newspaper. They eyed the waitresses in red guard uniforms, glossy plaits tied with red thread. They waved flags, slightly out of time, at the cacophonous stage show. It had begun with a hasty commercial precy of the Road to Rejuvenation exhibition. 1921, the First Party Congress. Deng Xiaoping, the Olympics, President Xi! Before lurching into battle reenactments and a suite of Maoist songs reset to a driving synth backing. Several dancers climbed onto chairs, egging the customers into a chant. Long live Chairman Mao! The customers were mainly men, a few glasses down, most too young to have lived through the era or regard this as anything other than novelty. Veteran Red Guards had spoken scathingly of the appetite for such entertainment, and there had been an outcry when students in Harbin recreated struggle sessions for their graduation photos, posing as if they were interrogating victims in dunces' hats. The anger wasn't surprising. But I wondered how the young were supposed to understand what they weren't allowed to know. Further back, a middle-aged man nursed his glass as he mused about the pleasures of the old days. After spending all day in work, I really enjoy singing and dancing here, he confided. Had the real thing been enjoyable? The cultural revolution? He gave a short, uncomfortable laugh. It's not good to say. Before I could ask more, the singer broke off to scream. If I find someone who knows this song but doesn't sing along, they don't respect Mao, 
and I'll seize them for a struggle session. New Year 2015 arrived. Soon I would be gone. Over the seven years I had been there, the pace of China's material development had become dizzying. More money, more people, more cars, more skyscrapers. There were four new billionaires each week. Yet to me it felt as though the country was shrinking, indefinably, but undeniably becoming denser and more suffocating. The state was ever more confident and combative. The people seemed more anxious. More activists disappeared into prison. The lawyers of dissidents were targeted. Then the lawyers of lawyers themselves were seized. Fewer people would take my calls. Strangers spoke less freely to me. Though the shift towards repression preceded Xi's ascension, he has imposed an extraordinary level of control, curtailing the freedoms won so painfully over decades. He has also amassed personal power in a way that few thought possible, and in 2022, he embarked upon indefinite rule with a norm-breaking third term and no successor in sight. Xi Jinping is at once powerful and reassuring, a remote authority and a kindly presence with an avuncular smile. He understands better than anyone since Mao how to deploy mass emotion, how to tell his people a story, give them a purpose. Propaganda has called Xi the people's leader and helmsman. The titles are pure Mao. And the echoes of the Cultural Revolution clang louder. China once more stakes a claim to global leadership. At home, no one is too big to be toppled. Tycoons and senior party figures are felled. Conversations between friends are policed again. Undergraduates report on their lecturers for straying beyond the political limits. Authorities prosecute peaceful activists for sedition. There is far worse in Xinjiang, where almost all Uyghur or other Muslim minorities have been herded into camps. To criticise Xi is more dangerous than ever now, and the Cultural Revolution's legacy is more relevant than ever. It was safer when it felt like an anomaly, or at least a full stop at the end of Maoism. But now, primary school children carry books with Xi's image upon the cover and sit down to study Xi Jinping thought. And so these stories belong to another age, not the decade of the Cultural Revolution itself, but the time when people, at least a few, found a space to share them. <laughs>